efforts were made to try and break through that door you say it was locked. What efforts were the officers making to try and break through either that door or another door to get inside that classroom? None at that time. The, the on-scene commander at the time believed that it had transitioned from an active shooter to a barricaded subject. You have people who are alive, children who are calling 911 saying, please send the police. They are alive in that classroom. There are lives that are at risk. Hey, That's not we're, we're, well, is we're, it? we're well aware of that. Right, yeah. but uh, why was this decision made not to go in and rescue these children? Again, you know, the uh, on-scene commander considered a barricaded subject and that there was time and there were no ch more children at risk. Obviously, ob obviously, you know, based upon the information we have, there were children in that classroom that were at risk and it was, in fact, still an active shooter situation and not a barricaded subject. So there was 19 officers in there. In fact, there was plenty of officers to do whatever needed to be done, with one exception, is that the, the incident commander inside believed they needed more equipment and more officers to do a tactical breach at that point. That's why BORTAC was requested on the scene as soon as they were there. They executed a search, or at least a, a dynamic entry, and went in. And uh, of course, that was not until 12, that was not until 12, 57. Hey, hey, with the, hey, with the, hey, with the benefit of, hey, with the benefit of hindsight, hey, the benefit of, hey, stand by, stand by, hey, stand by, hey, stand by, right? I got it, I got, I got it. Okay, hey, from the, from the benefit of hindsight, where I'm sitting now, then of course it was not the right decision. It was a wrong decision. Period. There's no, no excuse for that. But again, of Texas who uh, talked about being livid at the fact that he says he was misled by the uh, officers and about the officers' response to the Uvalde shooting. And uh, we heard him talk about his investigation by the Texas Rangers and the FBI. As soon as that information is gotten, they will give the information to the families about the result of that investigation. He also talked about what strategies, what best practices have to be employed, what mistakes, if any, were made here. He was very strong in his opinion that they should have eliminated the killer and rescued the children. Uh, and in response to a question about 18-year-olds being allowed to get a long gun or a rifle, the, Texas, the uh, governor was very clear that in Texas, for the last century and a half, 18-year-olds have been able to get long guns. And it's only in the last decade or so that we've been hearing about school shootings. So I guess that, uh, Greg, I'll start with you. We've got a livid governor, uh, justifiably livid, as I think everyone at this table is tonight, with the fact that we have been misled as to what the facts were. Well, I think the important thing he said was, uh, uh, and it's something that I said yesterday, is we only get to the scene of the story after it happens, and we should address every variable, every step that gets you to that crime, whether it is mental illness, schools, family, red flags. The fact that he said that this is a new thing in a decade and a half, that kind of points you in the direction of where the answers are. Why are these things happening more and more in this kind of society? Is it something that has to do with not simply the availability of guns because they have been available, it's social media, uh, it's a, a decline in education, it's a breakdown of the family, but these are a lot of things that we don't want to talk about because we've avoided these problems for so long. We've avoided these problems for 50 years. I think you could say, you know, the governor is livid and you could say, well, maybe the police were incompetent or they were they were afraid or they were adherent to a doctrine that prevented improvising. But that is not my place. That's his place. And that is the place for the investigators to let them investigate fully to tell the story, which is necessary. You need the scrutiny because there's going to be a next time. And the information you glean from this time will help you in the next time. That's why it's important. And it isn't Monday morning quarterbacking for investigators or law enforcement or family members, survivors, to question these variables. That is entirely their right. However, I feel like as a media, we have to be very careful because we Monday morning quarterback five days a week. <laughs> and we assume, it's amazing to me how we all become experts on every, I, I'm a, you know, it's amazing. And I didn't go to school for any of this, but somehow I can have an opinion. So I think be humble, let them do the job, let them talk about what the police did or didn't do, and try to try to keep your again 
let the story grow, let the facts pile up. You know, uh, Joey, the, the the, the, the governor was talking about, and, and the uh, state head of the, uh, 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 the Department of Public Safety came out and said that the school director, I think his name was McGraw, uh, made a mistake, and that they, instead of dealing with this guy, Ramos, as an active shooter, they dealt with him as a barricaded shooter. Now, you've got adherence to the chain of command. You're a military guy. You've got parents outside screaming, yelling, uh, being handcuffed, according to some, being thrown to the ground, according to others, or listening to shots periodically through this. Do you always listen to chain of command in a situation where your gut is telling you that there is an active shooter? I'm hearing an active shooter in there. Number one, I'm a military guy, not a police guy. That's two different things. Well, chain wanna... of command is chain of command. Fair, fair. Well, reason for pointing that out is not to assume any credibility I don't have on the topic. Right, right. So Monday morning quarterbacking or voicing the fact that expectations were not met, those are two very different things. The governor's the chief executive in that state over their law enforcement. It's his job to say these are the protocols we have. Active shooter is you run to the gun. You go to the gun and you take it out, all right? A hostage situation is very much different. I text Pete Hegseth. 48 hours ago and said, man, this looks a lot like they handled it like a hostage situation. That doesn't make sense. And officials canceling their in-person appearances in the wake of the Uvalde massacre. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick writing that despite his strong support for the Second Amendment, he did not want to bring additional, quote, pain or grief to the families of those suffering in Uvalde. In a pre-recorded message, Texas Governor Greg Abbott arguing gun control doesn't reduce crime. There are thousands of laws on the books across the country that limit the owning or using of firearms. Laws that have not stopped madmen from carrying out evil acts on innocent people. Among the 14 acres of guns, gear, and ammo exhibited here, attendees divided over how elected officials might prevent more tragedies like Uvalde. No one can own a weapon unless you're 25 years old. 25? 25. 25. That's my thinking. When you hear some of the stuff that gun control advocates kick around after a shooting like this, like raising the age, like to make it 21 maybe to buy a long gun, or things like red flag laws, more background checks, is any of that the kind of thing you would support? No. I think we really need to look at mental health. All right, Garrett joins us now. Garrett, you're outside the convention right now. I'm curious, what's the crowd temperature like there? Uh, it's high, Tom. There has been no violence here today, only shouting back and forth across the street between demonstrators and attendees here out in this Texas heat, a reflection of just how divisive this issue is.